to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. Welcome to Church at Home. This precious time that we get to share together, spend time in the Word to pray for one another, for some of us to fellowship, that beautiful part of Christianity that we are not called to follow Jesus alone, but in community with others, to share with others, to cry with others, to laugh with others. And I trust that today you will be strengthened in faith by our time together. Can we close our eyes as we pray together before we start? Lord Jesus, thank you again for this time that we can spend together. Thank you that your word is enduring, Lord God, that your word throughout the ages has never changed and will never change, not in its content nor in its outcome, Lord. And your word continues to build us up, to stir faith within us, to reveal you, Jesus, to us. And so I pray for every one of us this morning. I pray that Jesus, through the power of your spirit, you would reveal yourself to us, that we would see something more of who you are, that we would grow in our faith, and that we would grow in our love for one another. And I pray this in your glorious name. Amen. Last week, we looked at the fact that the Bible, this beautiful collection of stories, this crazy, unique book, It's full of stories. It's stories of ordinary men and women doing extraordinary things because they serve an extraordinary God. I love that the Bible doesn't hide the frailties and the brokenness of the heroes of our faith because the heroes of our faith are not the people themselves. The hero of our faith is Jesus. And they live, in a sense, as examples for us. And these stories have been given to encourage, to inspire us. We saw in Hebrews chapter 11 that it would take too long, as the author there writes, to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and of all the prophets. And that all of these stories, they they weren't just randomly selected but they were carefully curated by the Holy Spirit for a very specific goal. And that specific goal we read about in Romans chapter 15 from verse 4, where it says, whatever was written, this is the English Standard Version, whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. The stories were recorded. To give us hope. Each of the stories demonstrate to us something of God's character, something of his ways. And in Bible school, we unpack these and we help us to grow in our understanding of God's character and his God ways, God's ways. We love to have you join us for that. And when we begin to see God at work in their lives as sort of played out before us in these stories, this stirs hope. It stirs hope that there is a better end. Hope that there is joy that awaits us. Hope of an eternal love. Hope that brokenness, as we find in this earth, will end. Hope of peace. Hope of our own story being redeemed. I encouraged you last week, or at least I tried, that God wants to give you stories. Stories that will stir hope in your heart and stories that will give hope to others. I hope that even in this past week, you were somehow willing to take a risk, to step out, to trust God, to bring grace to someone in need. And I trust that as you began to step out, to see what happens, that you had an encounter with God's provision and a story of hope was birthed. Perhaps you were even reminded of an old story of God's goodness that you carry with you. The story of his faithfulness, of his grace, of his power. And you simply stepped out to share that story with someone else and brought them hope in this way. Every story has moments, highlights, the the beacons that mark the way. But every proper story also has an underlying storyline. It's the golden thread that holds the story together. 
for us guys, you know, we can watch the highlights of the rugby or the football, the cricket match afterwards. And it's just a little bit different watching the highlights and seeing the moments to watching the whole game and seeing the story unfold. There's a story that runs through every one of these Bible stories, every one of these moments, they're knitted together. And we've explored some of these stories in our sermons earlier this year. And we looked at certain Bible characters. And even now in our characters of the Bible series on our social media, we're unpacking just a little bit of of the greatest story within these lives. Let's take Moses as an example. He had some profound moments. There was this boy in the river initially as his mom was just terrified that the son was about to be killed. She put him and she cast him upon the waters and God's grace was there. There was the moment that Moses had with a burning bush where he had to take off his shoes because the place where he was standing was holy and he encountered God in such a profound way. There were the plagues as he went back to Egypt and the deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. There was the parting of the Red Sea. There was Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. And Moses had a pretty serious highlights package to his life. But if we string all of these stories together, we see a greater story. We see a story of God's redemption despite Moses' many failings. We see a story of God's faithfulness and God's goodness. Not because of Moses, but despite Moses. We see a story that encourages me personally, no end. A story that God can and wants to work with us despite our failings, despite our shortcomings. We see the same with King David. We think perhaps when we think of King David, we think of this moment when he slayed the giant Goliath. The moment when he is this king and he he comes back and the woman in town, kind of he's this rock star, social media influencer, deluxe, he's not king yet. And the woman are singing the song, Saul the king, he has slain his thousands, but David, he has slain ten thousands. And yet we see so many failings in David's life as well. And the Bible does not hide them from us. Similar with Abram, with Esther with Peter or any other of the Bible characters, these stories that encourage us, that bring us hope, how God moves upon and in and through their lives, not because of them, but despite them. As we consider that the Bible and indeed our lives are full of stories, it's also true that it is all in fact one story, his story, God's story. It's the story of God's unending grace towards a very broken humankind. A story of love, a story of redemption, and a story of God's glory. And this seemingly small, but I believe utterly significant truth is a key to living a life of fulfillment and a life of purpose. You see, we start really living life the way that God intended for us to live it. We come alive, if you will, when we begin to see our little story as a part of his eternal story. This is when life makes the most sense and perhaps even when it is most enjoyable. We can either live our life as if we are the main character in this really small, insignificant story. Or we can live as if we play a a small but loving and precious role in a very big and eternally lasting story. We can be the center of our own little story, or embrace that God is the center of all of history. And in this way, God, in a sense, invites us into his story. The truth, though, is that God is already working in your life. He's already working in my life and each one of our lives long before we've accepted his invitation to step into his story or invited him into our story. He's been at work all the time. The the only question is whether we are working with him or against him. Are we content to not be the center or are we fighting still to be cast in the main role? The whole of the Bible tells us the story as much as every one of these individual lives carry a story of themselves. They're all in a sense highlights of one big story of God's grace. And if we look at all of those stories 
strung together. And the story of, across those stories, we can summarize it in many ways, but one of the truths, one of the golden threads that come through is that our story changes when we allow God to lead. That we allow Him to be the lead character in the story. When we step away from needing to be in charge, needing all of the attention focused on us, when we, in a sense, let go of the glory and we say, God, the glory, if any in this life, is to you and for you. And if it comes to me, God, it's from you. Because to you are all things and from you are all things, God. So to God be the glory. We see a beautiful example of this in Luke 19. And from verse chapter 1, just 10 verses. We don't see much about this person. We don't have a long history. He's not the most rounded character in Scripture in the sense that we see him in different, organ- different situations and we see him growing and his character developing. But we see here, just in, in these 10 verses, a glimpse, as we could have picked pretty much any story in Scripture. But we see a glimpse here of somebody's life who gets transformed when he allows Jesus to become the center of the story. From verse 1 in Luke 19, Jesus entered Jericho and he made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. The implication here is that he was a little bit dishonest as well. That he had become rich not because he was necessarily a good and an honest tax collector who was working really hard. But the implication here is that he was skimming a little bit off the top. He was taking a little bit more tax perhaps than he should have and he would stick it in his pocket and he would then pass that on to the Romans at that time. Also, sort of the tax collectors at this time, they worked for the Romans who were an oppressive force. The people in Israel living sort of throughout that region, they were all oppressed. They were in a sense a vassal state and they would pay taxes to the Roman Empire. And the tax collectors typically were Jews who had one attender as such to become the tax collectors. And they were not loved very much. They were the ones who were in charge of taking money from the local people and giving it to their oppressors. And so this is the story of Zacchaeus. Here is the man and he wants to look at Jesus. But he couldn't see Jesus because he was short. He was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. I love just this example of who Jesus is. Here, can you imagine this guy, Zacchaeus? He's got a story here to tell. Even this moment, he is sitting in a tree. A person who has never met before knows his name. Jesus sees him. and He calls him by name. Zacchaeus, he says, quick. Come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Jesus invites himself right there into Zacchaeus's life. And he comes and he does that in my life and in your life. He, he finds ways to invite himself into our lives. And then he just waits for us to respond to say, yes, Jesus, in you come. And so Zacchaeus does exactly that. Zacchaeus quickly, in verse 6, climbs down the tree and he took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. I love this phrase in the New Living Translation here, this idea of a notorious sinner. If you think of your community, your environment, the people around you, are there notorious sinners that you can think of? Perhaps if you think of your own life, you realize that you're a notorious sinner in some ways. And yet that never intimidated Jesus. Jesus steps out into this life of this notorious sinner. He freaks the religious people of the day out. They're displeased. Jesus, you're holy and you're pure. You should come and be at my house because I'm holy and I'm pure. Obviously, none of us are. but That's sometimes a little bit what is hidden within our heart. And yet Jesus here steps out to be with a notorious sinner. And so they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. Watch this transformation that happens in this man's life. And he says, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people 
on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. I love the story of Zacchaeus. It's just 10 verses. There is so much about Zacchaeus we don't know. We don't know what happened in Zacchaeus' life next week, next month, next year. But we see here a glimpse of just such significant life change that happened when Zacchaeus understood there was someone more important in his life than himself. Jesus walks past and invites himself into Zacchaeus' life. Zacchaeus responds. His life changes in the most profound way. That's exactly what God comes, what he does. And even today, I want to encourage us to live our lives, not as if we are the center of our own story, but to deliberately step back and say, Jesus, can you come and be the center? You're the protagonist. Jesus, be the main character of my life story. That's so different to the way the world lives around us, the way in which we perhaps get taught and told to live by sort of our friends and society at large, which says that it's all about building ourselves up, making ourselves popular, getting the best at our job, and not saying any of those inherently necessarily are bad, growing in your skill and your ability and all of those things. Are we willing to step back and say, Jesus, be the center? Be the very central point. Jesus, my life story is not this volume, this book, this edition that's written by by itself, that's going to be on a book rack one day and people are going to come past and say, I want to read the story of Philip. No, my story is perhaps a chapter, maybe a big chapter, maybe a small chapter, but in this volume of eternity. That tells of the goodness, the glory, and the grace of God. I wonder what is your life story? Not the moments, not the highlights, but that story of how Jesus comes. And if you look back over your life, you will see that he works in all of our lives in a variety of different ways. But most of us, if we look back over our life story, there's a theme that our story tells. For Moses, it was God's redemption in the midst of his failure. Every one of us, there's a story that we can tell that we have seen God in this. We have learned this of God. We know this about God, not because I had a moment, but because moment of the moment of the moment testifies to this. And as we embrace these stories, as we grow in these stories, as we gather more stories because we're willing to step out, we see God more and more showing himself strong. Let us tell these stories. Let us share these stories. Let us live these stories so that they too may bring hope and encouragement for others. Can I pray for us as we close? Jesus, thank you for your great story. Thank you that even today in the midst of your story, you are smiling down over our little stories, Lord. And Jesus, we just want to come this morning and again surrender to you. We want to say, Jesus, would you be the center of our lives, God? Right now, God, we step down from that main character position, the role, the chair that's been set aside for star of the show. And Lord, we step away from that chair and we say, Jesus, this is your chair. Lord, let our life song, let our life story tell of your goodness and your glory. Father, I pray for everyone who's listening to this message and this prayer and thinking, I don't have a story. I don't know God's goodness and his grace. I can't bring hope and encouragement to others. I pray, Jesus, that you would bring hope and encouragement to them. That you would begin to stir faith even in their hearts. And as you do that, Jesus, that you would lead them in their story. And Jesus, as they lead in the story of your goodness and grace, as you lead them in that story, as they discover that, Lord, that they would be so eager to tell of it, to share it, Lord God, that they would always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in their hearts as Scripture commands us. Father, I pray that the stories we have, the story you've given us, Lord, I I pray that they may not be dormant, Lord God. I pray that we won't shelve them away somewhere, Lord God, at the bottom of a pile 
that there will be stories that we tell continually and repeatedly. That we would live stories of your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed a, a prayer like that of inviting Jesus to be the center of your life for the first time as you were watching this, I want to ask you, please reach out to us. Contact us at our church, Shafa Pretoria. We would love to meet with you, to get to know you in person, to pray with you. And we really rejoice in those moments where Jesus says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. And perhaps you can identify a little bit with Zacchaeus who comes to know Jesus for the first time and we rejoice in the work that Jesus has done and is doing in your life. God bless you. Have a phenomenal day further. And I hope that we get to see you in person really soon. God bless. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash Pretoria.